Lord, in the next few moments of this meeting, I thank you, God, that you will get past our minds, past, past our situation, whatever we came here carrying, and you're going to get right into the core of our hearts, right into the center of our lives, God. And Lord, we thank you, God, because of who you are. Lord, everything, God, oh, because of who you are, not just because of what you do, not because of what we need, but because of who you are, Lord. That's why we're here today, Jesus. Open our hearts, Lord, to receive the engrafted word, and we thank you for it. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, we had originally scheduled on Thursday night Prophet Kevin to, uh, to minister, and so tonight we kind of had to, to, to reshift some things, and, uh, and, and Prophet Kevin, I, I just, I really believe I have a word to kick this conference off, but tonight Kevin came and, and he was sharing some things with me, and I believe he has an introduction for this message tonight. Are you ready? Come on, let's give Prophet Kevin a big hand as he comes. Good evening. I believe that the Spirit of God wants to impact every single person that's here. How many realize that when God does something, there's a beginning and there's a middle and there's an end? And whenever God does something, he always has eternal purposes. And the Bible says that we're going to go from glory to glory to glory. Or image to image to image. Or function to function to function. And whenever there's the end of one season of glory, the most uncomfortable time is in between the glories. Somebody say, in between the glories. When one season stops and the other one starts, there's that uncomfortable time like puberty when you're too big to be small and you're too small to be big. And so what happens is that I believe that the church world is in one of those seasons. And one of the things that happens is that God announces purposes. God declares the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. And when you read the book of Acts, there's a word that says, and suddenly, I believe for spiritual people, we shouldn't have that many suddenlies. Because if we're walking with God, we kind of know what's going to happen. We don't know exactly, but we've got a suddenly that God wants to let us in on before it happens. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, I'm going to kind of set this message up that Lynn is going to preach, and I really felt something dropped in my spirit. And one of the good things about being in a prophetic house, say, it's good to be in a prophetic house. <laughs> prophetic means that you're saying what God is saying in that same time. And it's good to be in a house of relationships. Say, a house of relationships. House of relationships. If you don't have relationships and you have an anointing, you're going to be an orphan. Because God does everything by relationships. He always measures us in the context of relationships. So let me give you the picture of this setting. Saul, the first king of Israel, has now died. David was the prophesied king, and now he has been prince of Judah, but he's now coming where all the tribes are coming to anoint him. And they really don't know what's happening. They just feel drawn to the place called Hebron. Everybody says Hebron. Hebron was a city in Judah, which is the tribe of praise. And Hebron means relationships. What does Hebron mean? Relationships. What does Hebron mean? Relationships. And so one of the 12 tribes was a tribe called Issachar. It says, and the sons of Issachar, which had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, the chiefs were 200 and their brethren were at their command. The word Issachar means recompense or to get your stuff back. What does Issachar mean? It means recompense, that God is trying to give us something back. 
And so Issachar's main job, as I've read and understood historically, was that they were the timekeepers of the nation. And they didn't have calendars like we had and couldn't do all the computation. And so Israel was on a religious calendar. Times and seasons and events and very chronicled and very specific. And God limited himself to that calendar. If God says, I'm going to have a feast of this, then God would become what that feast needed. His presence has a purpose. Everybody say, His presence, his presence. Has, a has a purpose. His presence, his presence. Has, a purpose. has a purpose. And prophetic preaching announces the purpose, and then the Spirit of God <laughs> comes on that purpose. And so when you're in a non-prophetic church, you can have good principles, but no presence. If I have principles without presence, there will always be perversion. Everybody says principles without the presence will always have perversion. And so they were the type of the shadow of the prophetic timekeepers. Acts chapter 1 verse 6 down to verse 8. I believe that we are in a confusing time in North American and world culture. I think the church is confused about their purpose. I think there's many, many uncertain voices in the church. They say nice things, but not the right thing. They're like a guy that puts a new radio in a car that won't run. They put nice wheels and tires in a car that doesn't go anywhere. I need something to get me into the purposes of God. So after 42 months of being apprenticed, everybody say apprenticed. I do not like the word disciple in English. I don't like it in Spanish or Portuguese because the word disciple means a place of just hearing a monolithic sermon. You just hear a, you don't hear a dialogue, you hear a monologue. I'm just sitting, I'm here a talking head. I want to be trained. And so Jesus said, come be my apprentices. We have lots of learners but few apprentices in the kingdom of God. That's why I think a generation under 30 don't want to be in church. Jesus did not say, I come that you may have meetings and then more often. <laughs> I'm meeting now, y'all. I just, I'm sick of meetings. If we meet, I want God to show up. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? I'm tired of hearing somebody promise something that hasn't happened and probably won't happen. So the disciples are with Jesus. He's about to be ascended. He has died and resurrected. It's the end of the 40 days where he's ascending to heaven. And these brain-dead disciples, they were captured by a religious culture. They did not understand the entire purpose, but they were about to receive it, and they didn't even know it. I'm reading for the New King James, Acts chapter 1, verse 6 down to verse 8. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel or restore the kingdom back to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons where the Father has put his in authority. But you shall receive power or you shall be empowered when the Holy Ghost shows up. When will I be empowered? Your answer is when the Holy Ghost shows up. When will I be empowered? When will you be empowered? When the Holy Ghost shows up. Put more power in your declaration. When will you be empowered? When the Holy Ghost shows up. When will I be empowered? When the Holy Ghost shows up. So if I don't have the Holy Ghost where he's in my lordship, where I'm his, his disciple, I'm following him as Lord, then I don't have any power. I may have good principles. And they said, when are we going to get the kingdom back? And he says, and you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the earth. If you haven't read this version of the Bible, I encourage you to download it and get it. It's called the Passion Bible. Acts chapter 1, verse 6, down to verse 8. And every time they were gathered together. Very interesting. This version says, and when they were gathered. But it says, all the time they came together, they were saying to Jesus, When's the kingdom going to be restored to Israel? They kept saying it for 42 months. When is Israel going to be like it was when King David was alive? That's where all of our enemies are overruled. 
We kicked the Greeks out, kicked the Romans out, kicked the Sumerians out. And we're back to where we started in the beginning. And they asked Jesus, Lord, is it time now for the free Israel and restore our kingdom? And he answered, the Father is the one who says fixed dates and times and their fulfillment. You are not permitted to know the timing of all that has prepared in his authority. But I promise you this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be filled with power or empowered. You'll be my messengers in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, distant provinces, even to the remote places in the earth. Somebody scream as loud as you can, no kingdom substitutes. No kingdom substitutes. One more time. No kingdom substitutes. One more time. So we have the promise of power, and we have the reality of people who are disempowered. I don't think there's anything more common than Christians who are disempowered. They're discouraged. They're hopeless. They barely attend church. They come dragging into the church. They come late, leave early, don't pay any money. I said, you ought to say hallelujah right there. They don't pay any money. Jesus said that where your heart is, where your treasure is. That's what he said. And so they've been disempowered. And so I'm going to go back to Jesus for a second. Eve was in a perfect garden with a perfect husband, with a perfect God, and she ended up being kicked out. You know why? She became disempowered because she lost sight of her identity. See, the way you see the Father, the way you see him as king and as creator shapes who you are. If I can't see him the way he is, I cannot see myself the way I was supposed to be. The Bible said that God made mankind, not just women, not just men, but mankind in his image. And so if I don't see him as father, as king, as creator, about all the faces that he presents himself with... It is impossible to see myself. So she's in a perfect environment. And then the serpent comes, but he doesn't look like a serpent. He was a cherubim, the most glorious angel. He appeared with cherubim glory. And he began to lie. Hear me. I don't care how glorious the building is, the costume is, the pageantry is. I don't care how much the, the, the church has this grandeur. If they don't point to the Father's nature, the King nature, then we have nothing to listen to. So Satan shows up as a cherubim and he begins to question God's nature and his goodness. And he says, has God said he put doubt where there should be faith? Have you ever had people say, well, why would God let this happen to me? In that little whiny voice, everybody put the whiny voice there, saying, Why? Come on, put that, say, say, why when God let this happen to me? Wah, 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 wah. You ever seen them crying and say, wah, wah, wah. turn to your neighbor, cry a little bit, say, wah, wah, wah. listen, we're supposed to be victorious. And if you're always whining, that means you've been hearing the devil that spoke to Eve. God's a good God all the time. God's a good God. If you don't understand, God's a good God. And so what happened in the garden was that Satan got her to distrust God's father nature, God's king nature, God's creator nature. So now she turns it back on him. His questions made her see herself as a victim. God cannot deliver victims. He cannot bless victims. The moment she began to see herself as a victim, rebellion was the next logical step. I just prophesied to America. The moment that you see yourself as a victim, rebellion is the next logical step. Now notice they said, Jesus, when will you restore the kingdom to Israel? Not knowing that it wasn't going to be a physical kingdom anymore. It was a supernatural heart kingdom. Somebody say, a supernatural heart kingdom. So the moment Satan stole her identity, she became a victim. She saw this other tree, it became an option. 
You always look for non-kingdom options when you're a victim. I said you always look at non-kingdom options when you see yourself as a victim. And of course, she ate the fruit, and we've had the tragedy ever since that. Now, why is this so important? God cannot change you until you want to be changed from a victim to a son and a daughter. James chapter 1, verse 19, down to verse 20. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath or the violent anger of a man does not produce the righteousness of God. God cannot use angry people in the flesh. I'm going to say it again. God cannot use angry people in the flesh. There is a righteous anger, but there's always a supernatural attachment to that anger that something supernatural happens. If you're just mad and nothing supernatural happens, this scripture is about you. I said, if you're just mad and nothing supernatural happens, we know it wasn't God's anger because he didn't show up. Some of y'all just mad saints. Y'all just unsanctified saints. James chapter 1 verse 20 in the Passion Bible. It says because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Everybody say accept no kingdom substitutes. Come on say accept no kingdom substitutes. Satan's great plan is if he cannot get you from the kingdom, he'll give you a substitute for the kingdom. And the church right now is full of substitutes. Has anybody heard the term social justice? Has anybody heard the term social justice warrior? Let me give you the etymology of that word. The term social justice has its roots in Catholic texts and generally means the distribution of advantages and disadvantages to individuals in society. It became very popular in the 60s and the 70s in Central America where the Catholic Church solved all the injustices and rather than get a supernatural kingdom, they adopted a type of communism, socialism to try to bring the kingdom of God. Everybody say socialism. Cannot bring, the kingdom. cannot bring the kingdom. You know why I can't bring the kingdom? Because they're still having the broken human nature. The kingdom of God only works after you've been born again. If you could have a kingdom without being born again, we wouldn't have to get born again. The Investopedia offers this definition. Social justice is the idea that all members of society deserve an equal footing in terms of opportunities, political rights, distribution of wealth, privilege, so that they can lead fulfilling lives and realize their potential in the community. The biggest issue under the social justice umbrella today can be broken into two category, can be broken into two categories that overlap. How people are treated unequally in society because of their gender, race, age, sexual orientation, immigration status, or disability, and how government policies affect people unequally, including the taxes and access to education. The social justice warrior is a term for an individual who promotes socially progressive views, including feminism, civil rights, multiculturalism, identity politics, involving the treatment of ethnic, racial, gender, or gender identity minorities. Now, why did I just read that? In the book of Acts, the disciples said to Jesus, will you at this time restore the kingdom of God to Israel because they were being mistreated in every area by the Romans? How many understand that? They're under an oppressor. And they said, when are we going to get our kingdom back or our nation back like when David had it? Probably the chief person in Jesus' and the disciples that was angry was Judas. He was furious. Judas wanted to have social justice for Israel. I believe that, Ju I believe that Judas betrayed Jesus not, not to get him killed, but to provoke Jesus for social justice. Because he saw Jesus with all this power. So he said, I will tell the Romans where he is. Jesus will be forced to use his power and bring the kingdom of God. Judas was a social justice warrior. 
He was trying to bring the kingdom of God to you human methods. Is anybody hearing me yet? Now, why is this so important? The devil uses the same trips he's always used. You know why? They still work. The devil has not changed his tricks. You know why? They still work. That's why he still uses them. The book of Galatians says, There is therefore now in God's church neither Greek nor Jew, slave or free, male or female. There's not racism in God's church. Not supposed to be. There's not sexism in God's church. Not supposed to be. There's not classism in God's church, rich and poor. Not supposed to be. We're dealing with the same devil that they did 2,000 years ago in the book of Galatians. And so we have people in the church, rather than being spirit-filled and empowered by the Holy Ghost, they're walking around like Judas trying to bring social justice by the flesh and not by the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. See, just because you see something is wrong, if I don't have the appointment of God's power to turn it around by changing people's hearts, I have a social justice Judas attitude. Everybody say, social justice, social justice. Judas attitude. Judas attitude. Social, justice, social justice, Judas attitude. And the devil's got the entire North American continent, Europe, all fussed up about these issues. Just like they were. When are you going to bring the kingdom back to us? Kick the Romans out. They were highly oppressive of the Jewish people. God says that kind of kingdom will not last. It operates by oppression, by dominance. That's how it operates. He said, I have a new kingdom. A kingdom of the heart. You got to get a revelation of the king. You got to begin to see the king from the heart, not outwardly, from the inside out, not the outside in. And so there's always been a temptation when we see injustice to have anger and bitterness and hatred to try to do in the natural what can only be done by the spirit. And that thing is in this room today. Some of you are victimized by your situation. I'm a black woman. I'm a Latin man. I don't have any money. They ought to give me some of their money. I believe in equal outcomes. God doesn't. God doesn't believe in equal outcomes. He believes in equal opportunity. No worky, no eaty. You want to sit on your blessed assurance? Great, but don't expect me to pay for it. That's the kingdom, guys. Now, why am I saying this? Satan has crept in Jesus' church with a social justice warrior identity agenda to try to take people really called like Judas was called. It wasn't that Judas wasn't called. He wanted to do it in the flesh, not the spirit. And as Lynn comes today, my God. God is going to rip off that social justice Judas demon out of you. It's not by flesh. It's not by power. It's by the Spirit of the Lord. It's by the Spirit of the Lord. It's not by might. It's not by human power. It's by the Spirit of the Lord. Come on, just raise your hands and say, Holy Spirit. If there is a Judas, social warrior inside of me that wants change without God's kingdom power, tear it out of me. Rip it out of me. I don't want to be Judas for my generation. I don't want to be a social warrior Judas. For my generation. 
Well, give your pastor a mighty hand of applause as he comes. It's called tag team preaching, right? Let me tell you the thing that he was sharing, the problem that we run into when we're dealing with the issues of our culture and society which are not getting better is that this generation is still unmoved, unchanged, unimpressed by what they see in the church. Because the church, exactly as Kevin was just, was just speaking to you, says nice things but not the right thing. And so we are delivering a message, but there's no power to change. The Bible talked about in the last days that there would come a time, a generation, that would have a form of godliness, but would deny the power. And it said, from such turn away. This is the thing that we are hitting. Listen, we don't have conferences here just because we need to have more meetings. We want to touch heaven. We want to challenge you. God gave me the theme of this conference at the beginning of this year that said we were going to talk about empowering you as believers to be who God called you to be for this generation. To be who he called you to be. And so I want to tag off of that to give you the key today that I believe is going to unlock the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, not human empowerment, but God empowerment on the inside of you. God empowerment on the inside of you. So I want, in Mark chapter 9, you read a story of a father who, who brings a demon-possessed son to Jesus. And when he approaches Jesus with this tormented son, Jesus says these powerful words to him. In Mark 9, 23, you don't even have to turn there. We'll put it up. I'll have you turn to a scripture in a minute. He said, Jesus said, if you can believe, everybody say believe. All things are possible to him who believes. Say believe. I want to get to the foundation of what it means to be empowered for a broken generation. To show you what is the key to be empowered for your destiny. How many know God did not make a mistake when he called you to be born and alive today right here in 2018? God wasn't concerned about the political environment. He wasn't concerned about the social environment. He wasn't concerned about the violence. Any of those things when he called you to be created to be here. This is your day. This isn't a rehearsal. This is our day, guys. This is it. What happens in this generation is directly connected to how people in the church of Jesus Christ respond to the directives of God and how we carry not just a strong word but an empowered word for a generation who's not interested in hearing something. They're interested in seeing something and experiencing something, and that something has to come out of you. So I want to give you this foundation. The root of spiritual empowerment is identical to the root of your whole Christian identity, and it is what you believe. I actually have coined a new phrase called Christian atheist. Christian atheist. You know what a Christian atheist is? It's a person who says, I'm a Christian. They go to church. They do the things, but they don't actually believe what they believe. So I want to dig into what you believe about God, what you believe about the world around you, and what you believe about you. Because it's a vital component of life. All life is built on it. Belief is not a doctrinal statement. Belief is not a fundamental structure of religion. Belief is not a particular bend on, on religious theology. Belief has everything to do with the power, the underpinning of life that, that you live by. It's the foundation of your vision, your purpose. It's why you get up and get dressed in the morning. Everybody has faith. Everybody does things because they believe. Every one of you got people all over the world. I tell people this all the time. I love to talk to, to people. The last, it was a couple of years ago, I was on a, on a flight next to a guy who told me he was an agnostic. And, I, and they always ask me, so what do you do? And I always like... You know, I always want to, I want to tell them, but I don't want to tell them. And I, and it has nothing to do with me being ashamed of Jesus. I love Jesus and I proclaim Jesus everywhere I go. It has to do with the fact that as soon as somebody hears I'm a pastor, they immediately act different around you. They immediately talk different. They're like, oh, pardon my French. You know, they'll say stuff like that, you know. 
is the word. So I would rather you just be real. So as long as you don't know I'm a pastor, then you're going to be real with me, and I'd rather you just be real. So we started talking about that, and I started telling him, I said, he was questioning about faith. I said, everybody has faith. I said, you have faith. He says, I don't. I have a problem with faith. I said, no, you use faith. I said, why did you put clothes on today? And he couldn't answer that question. I said, why did you put clothes on today? And he did not have an answer for me except that I guess I was supposed to. Don't get me wrong. I'm glad you put clothes on, and you're very glad that I put clothes on today. I promise you that. But let me tell you something. Here's the thing. We do, do you know that we're the only living creature in creation that feels the need to cover ourselves? No other animal in the animal kingdom, no other thing does that. Do you know why? I mean, Genesis tells us why. It's actually an outward sign that we all believe we have sin in our life. We're all ashamed of being naked. Now, don't go start running around naked. But here's the thing. And, and it doesn't matter what culture. It doesn't matter how you were raised. But fundamentally, we all have faith. We all believe. We all do things based on our beliefs. So as a Christian, what you have to understand is there is nothing more important than what you believe and how you believe. I'm going to take this in a way that maybe you haven't heard before because you've heard, you've heard people say you are what you eat. Well, let me tell you, you are what you believe because what you believe ultimately becomes your reality. And we have a whole generation that has belief confusion and because of that they mix up different ideals. We have a bunch of Christians that have belief confusion. So on one hand, they're believing God and believing in God. On other hand, they're believing and supporting things that are opposite of God. And it all works for them because there's confusion in belief. And so guess what that leaves? It leaves a church with no power. It leaves us powerless. So we have to walk in the power of God. So we have to access this thing called faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is an expression of belief. In Romans 4, you don't have to turn there, it says, if Abraham was justified by works, if he was justified by what he did, he has something to boast about. But not before God. But what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. What made Abraham righteous? He believed. He believed. Nothing about what he did, nothing about his behavior, nothing about the, He believed. And it empowered him to be who God called him to be, even pre-redemption. This is absolutely amazing. So what opened the door for Abraham to be made right before God? Belief. What opens the door to make you right before God? Belief. What opens the door for you to be empowered to do what God has called you to do? Belief. No matter how hard you try, no matter what you do, regardless of how much you commit, you pray harder, you cry harder, you repent more. But even the very best of us still fall short of the righteousness of God. Because what we do never is quite good enough. I don't care how nice you look or how much you raise your hands in worship. There are moments in your life you do not want to be posted up on the screen here behind me, right? But God says when you believe, when you believe, it activates righteousness. And when righteousness, which means you're in a right position with God, you're walking right according to God, when you're with the right, in that right position, it allows God to empower you with his nature to be who you need to be for the generation that you are called to walk around. So your belief connects the space between where you fall short and where God expects you to be called faith. God said, I will mark your account as righteous even when you're not righteous just because you believe. This is powerful. It is the thing that separates your faith from every other faith. That. Because every other faith is built around something you do. Now, I know this is fundamental, but I'm setting up, I'm, I'm giving you a foundation. So, it, it's why you have to be careful about judging people. Because you see what they did, but you can't see where they are in their belief. 
And God will take a Saul who looks very good on the outside, who has a good marriage, everything's right, everybody respects him, and he will deny him as king and put in a David who is a murderer, a liar, not a great father, an adulterer, and he'll use him as king because his belief is different. Sometimes the one who is judging may not be as high on the books as the one they're judging because God is looking at their faith more than their failure. Come on, somebody needs to say, turn to somebody, say, God's looking at your faith more than your failure. John 3.18, I'm laying this foundation, John 3.18, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The reason we're not empowered personally and lack power spiritually is that we do not believe. Go up a couple of verses. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish. We miss this all the time, and it leaves us powerless to be the light that we're called to be in this generation because we're trying to get people to behave differently, but God wants people to believe. And when you believe, it unlocks supernatural power that allows you to be a changing force in a generation that seems to be unchangeable and going downward. So we give him our works, we give him our duties, we make sacrifices, we wear long dresses and no makeup, we put ichthys fishes on our car and crosses around our neck, we carry a Bible bigger than a two-year-old baby, and we want to look spiritual. But listen, listen, none of that makes us more spiritual and none of that impresses God. It is when we take God at his word, it is believing who God is and what he said and what he can do, and I believe he can do it. I believe he can do it. Somebody shout, I believe. The enemy wants to render you powerless, so he's doing everything he can to tear down your belief system. To corrupt your belief system. The key to empowerment is knowing who you are. And that's why it's like Christians are running around trying to be politically correct, scared of their own shadow, can't see anybody heal, can't cast out any demons, and demons are surrounded. Here's the problem. It is a believing problem. Either you need to believe who God is or go see a movie or something. At least you can be entertained. Come on, I'm not here just for entertainment. I want to see God do something. I want to see something we've never seen before. I I want to experience something that we've never experienced before. I want to see something erupt on the inside of me. Oh, my God. Come on. The key to that empowering belief is knowing who you are. If you don't know who you are, anybody can ascribe an identity to you. And you will morph into what they want you to be. And that's what's happened to this entire generation. So we have to know who we are. Some of us have been 10 or 12 different people, depending on who we were with. Because we don't know who we are. So we become whoever they want us to be. And then when they leave, then we're confused. Now listen, I have met some powerful, successful people and, but I have rarely met a successful person who did not have a strong sense of belief about themselves. And none of them were any more gifted than you. None of them. In fact, in many cases, they're less gifted, less talented, less skilled. They don't have any more than you. The only difference is they think differently. Life, I'm going to pull, I'm going to just tag right on, on this, what Prophet Kevin was saying, because life is an equal opportunity experience, no matter what society tells you. We don't all have the same opportunity, but we all have opportunity. But it's easier when we fall short or when we fail to blame someone else than to admit that we didn't take the opportunity. So God gives the opportunity, then you do with what God gives you, what, or what you do with what God gives you is up to you. That was confusing. A little confusing. You got to take what God gives you and do something with it. Come on, the person sitting next to you, they don't have any more than you have in terms of what potential God has put inside us. They might have done more with what they have, but they don't inherently have more. We see people that are at the bottom that make it to the top. 
And people that are at the top that never emerge and fall downward. It's not what you start with, it's what you do with what you have. Right? This is also true with your faith. It's also true with your belief. The Bible says God has dealt to every man, say every man, the measure of faith. Every man has the capacity to believe. It would not be right to, for salvation to be based on belief and then God give it to some and not to others. So with that in mind, I want to talk to you tonight about this man. This is the story I want to bring you to in this message. I want to talk to you about a man who is empowered by belief to become something that even in his own right never imagined he would. He was a man made to shake nations and sit with kings. He was a man designed to lead millions of people and be revered among all other men. But at the time we meet him in the scriptures, he's a runaway criminal. He's hiding and existing in personal exile away from society. How can you have a great and powerful destiny yet be in an isolated and dark situation? I'm talking about Moses. I want you to understand that the predicament that you're in right now, listen to this, does not define your destiny. The predicament you're in right now does not define the level you can be empowered by God. I'm going to go over here and tell them. Listen, the predicament that you're in right now does not determine what you're going to be in the future. Come on, all right, good, that's better. Let's come over here, I'll give you one more chance. Come on. The predicament that you are in right now is not the determining factor on the destiny that God has assigned you for the day that you live in. Anything that is not connected to the person of Jesus is a lie. How do I know? Because Jesus said it. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. So, Truth isn't an idea. Truth is not a concept. Truth is a person. And anything not connected to the person of Jesus is not true, even if it's real. You can study cancer under a microscope. It's real. But it's not true because it's not connected to the person of Jesus. So how do I convert the lie to truth? I have to change what I'm believing in. Everything we live in is like a binary code. Have you ever studied computer language at its root foundation? It's a series of ones and zeros. Everything you face in life is a series of truth and lies. And how you adjust your belief determines the reality of what will come out of your life in your lifetime. And this is so important because it's, it is the thing that keeps us locked up is our inability to believe because we are trapped by believing something that's not true about our generation, about who we are, about what God can do. Mm. I have to find my place here. Every time something besides God begins to whisper in your ear, you can't do this, you don't have what it takes, God doesn't hear you, you can't make it, you're going to end up like your mama. You have to talk back to those thoughts. And you have to say, hey, you're a liar. Every demon-provoked emotion, every thought against the Word of God, every voice that speaks contrary to the purpose of God in your life, every circumstance that stands in the face of what God has declared, you're a liar! I'm going to call out a liar today. I'm going to call out some lying spirits today that have stopped some of you from being who God has called you to be. And I believe in the name of Jesus, the lying power of Satan is broken over your life. The devil is a, yes he is. Come on, hit somebody next to you. Say, I'm calling out liars tonight. Sickness is a liar. Failure is a liar. Depression is a liar. Fornication is a liar. Addiction is a liar. I can't make it is a liar. A hurricane is a liar. Come on, you cannot stop what God wants to do if you will recognize who the truth is, who the boss is, and who it isn't. Mm. Mm. 
Some of you have been entertaining some lying voices. And we're shining some light on that thing today. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. It's not just truth that makes you free. It's knowing truth that makes you free. The thing is, when I begin to believe it, then I begin to receive it, whatever it is. Believing is the door. It's the entry to receiving something. So when I begin to believe God's word, when I begin to believe God's direction, when I begin to believe God's moral standard, when I begin to believe his power, then I begin to receive it in my life. And I can begin to see what God's doing even in a dark generation that's led by ungodly men. I can see what God is doing because I know the truth. And light enables you to see. Amen? So Christians have to reset our belief and abort every lying seed that has attached itself to the womb of your spirit, trying to give birth to false things in your life to keep you from being who God has called you to be. That's why we're so messed up in disunity, not hearing the same thing from the voice of God, not able to discern what's right and wrong, not walking in any power because we don't believe. Now, if I was God and I was going to look for somebody to choose to address world leaders and negotiate deliverance, lead millions of people out of bondage, I probably would not choose Moses, right? Because Moses did not have a really good background. I mean, he did in a sense, in, in one sense, he was raised in the palace of Pharaoh, but let, let's go earlier, right? From the beginning of his early childhood, he was hidden. His identity was hidden. His identity was confused. His greatness was hidden. His destiny was hidden. His purpose was hidden. He was not brought up in a normal environment. Hmm. Let's talk about normal for a minute. Moses spent his early months hidden in the house. His life was in danger of being found, then butchered and killed. That was his early childhood. So his early childhood is hidden. He's not outside. He's not doing the thing. Eventually his mom puts him in a basket, sets him afloat in a river full of snakes and alligators and who knows what else. Crocodiles, I guess that's what they have there. He was abandoned. He was adopted. He was a Hebrew by birth, but an Egyptian by situation. He had a confused language. He had a confused culture. He had a confused religion. What God or what gods or what ceremonies do I follow? He was a mis mixed up montage of ideologies. Yet God used him. That's what gives me hope for the generation we live in today. That's what gives me hope. Because I saw this generation in, in this past week and I was ministering, ministering in Palm Springs, California with a series of churches together to a, a dominantly young generation. And God shows me this generation like Moses in the basket. Like Moses in the Pharaoh's palace being given everything but confused in his ideology. And God chose him to be a deliverer. And I believe, can I just speak prophetically for a minute? If you are part of a generation, listen, I know we make millennial jokes and we do things. Listen, if you are part of this generation, the reason why the devil has fought you so hard is because you're called by God to be a Moses for your day. You're called by God to raise up and rescue your generation. His name Moses means to be drawn out. I think when greatness is inside of you, it has to be drawn out. When you're empowered, something inside of you has to be drawn out. Why would you make Moses your leader? He's, he's a confused individual with a broken childhood who became a failure, who tried to take matters into his own hands, ended up murdering a man because he had an anger issue, and then became a man on the run, running away from his own people and his own house because of the man he killed. 
He leaves Egypt a refugee, a criminal on the hit list. He flees Egypt in a mess he can't fix and runs away from the situation because of his own mistakes to make a new life for himself. He hooks up with another group of people, the Midianites, and they don't really know who he is. He wasn't a Midianite. He was born in Egypt, but wasn't really an Egyptian. He was a Hebrew, but he didn't have much Hebrew in him. In terms of culture, like Moses, you sometimes hook up with people that really think you're something, but they don't know what you really are. And if they knew who you really were, they wouldn't let you in. But God has covered you and held you for his purpose. The reason it's easy to deceive the people is because you're not sure who you are either. It's not that you're evil or wrong. It's just that I'm confused and I'm vulnerable and I'm susceptible. So when I don't know who I am, I guess I become whatever you call me. So when, listen, get this. When God found Moses, he's out in the desert with the Midianites. And we know he's at least 80 years old. He was 80 before God even reached out to use him. So don't think you've missed the mark. Come on, somebody. I was talking to the young generation. Now I'm going to talk to the older generation. Your time isn't over either. You have a voice. You have a purpose to be used by God. God can start using you whenever he wants. God can do his best with you at whatever point he chooses to. And for everyone who thinks you've got it all together, I have a newsflash. Sometimes it can take a long time to figure life out and be stable enough for God to use you. So here was Moses. He's leading sheep in the wilderness, far away from his home, far away from his destiny. He was leading sheep, but God was calling him to lead people. Your destiny is always camouflaged in some form in your history. Whatever God is empowering you to do, you are most likely already functioning in something that looks a little bit like it, but in a different dimension. In the next dimension, God is going to empower some of the things you didn't recognize in the first dimension. God, in a burning bush, he appears to Moses and tells him to take off his shoes because the ground he is on is holy ground. Then in an absolutely powerful empowering moment at over 80 years old God unfolds Moses destiny this is absolutely amazing it absolutely is amazing to me so God gives Moses this huge assignment to go to Pharaoh in Egypt to let to tell them to let God's people go so watch this he gave the assignment to someone who was running away and hiding and still confused and insecure, and intimidated, then he empowers him for an assignment. God comes to empower a man for a big assignment, but the man was still inadequate in so many ways. In him, in his own self, right? And here's the message for you. If you feel small, if you feel like you're not ready, it does not mean that it's not time for God to empower you. He just needs to intersect you at the moment that you're in so you can understand what he's trying to do and you can begin to step into this person that is inside of you. You kind of know it's there, but you don't know how to let that that, that destiny, that purpose, that, that person God's called you to be out of the cage of your soul. So turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. And this is where we come to the core of this message. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 1. We're going to read right in the beginning. Then Moses answered and said, this is God speaking to him from the burning bush, telling him to go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses answered, and this is what Moses said, but suppose they will not, what? Believe me. Or listen to my voice. Suppose they'll say, the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said, what is that in your hand? Bring me that staff up here. 
he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. Listen, if you start running from one thing, you'll end up running from everything. I like the staff. It's my office. That's why you need to stop running and face whatever you need to face and deal with whatever you need to deal with. Because time is short. and This generation is too important. Because if you run from the serpent, you'll end up running from Pharaoh. Then when are you going to stop running? Moses, you'll never be empowered if you run from the things that scare you. Have you ever been running from something that God gave you? Because it was scary. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. Now visualize this. How many of you want to grab a snake by the tail? And there might be some crazy people that like snakes and you're like, oh, we'll grab it by the tail. But God will call you to take a hold of something that you're scared of. Come on, say, take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe, that they may what? That they may believe. Why? Because it's not until they believe that God can bring them into freedom. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to you. So I want you to go back for a minute and process what I just read. Moses says, God, I would do it, but they won't believe me. But here's my question. Was it really that they would not believe? Or is it Moses imposing on them something that's really in him? I think about all the excuses we make that, that keep us from being who God called us to be. That keep us from doing what God called us to do, that keep us at a level that we're comfortable and we know and we can control, that keep us at a place that our generation is lost. You see, what you've been saying about they might really be you. What are you doing that is keeping you from being empowered? Well, they don't listen to me. They, they won't accept me. They don't support me. They don't embrace me. You'll never get anyone to embrace you till you embrace what's in you. You'll never get anyone to believe what you're preaching until you believe it yourself. Christian atheists. Because your they might be you in disguise. So God says to Moses, I want you to go speak for me. Moses says, they won't believe me, and I love what God doesn't do. God absolutely does not respond to what he says. He simply says this question, what's in your hand, Moses? A stick. Why didn't God address what Moses was trying to defend about what they would believe or not? Because what he believed about they was really just a reflection of what Moses believes about himself. And God was trying to empower Moses to be a leader. He was trying to shake him up in the midst of a place that he did not think he could escape to go and be a leader that Moses had no idea he could ever be. So God takes an inventory. Moses, what's in your hand? Tonight, on the first night of Stronger 2018, if I don't get anything else accomplished in terms of your empowerment, I want to ask this question, what is in your hand? What is in your hand? Before you assign your destiny to something externally, have you assessed what is in your hand? Somebody else could take what God's put in your hand and be empowered while you're crying about what's not in your hand. What's in your hand? God said, I don't need anything that's not in your hand to empower you, to strengthen you, to equip you, to bless you. I'm going to use something that is already in your hand. I feel like I'm talking to somebody right now. So verse 2, what is that in your hand? All the situations in your life will illuminate what is not in your hand. But God doesn't need anything 
that is not in your hand. Your destiny is hidden in what is in your hand. All the situations, but your destiny is hidden. All the voices, but your destiny is hidden is hidden in what's in your hand. All the reasons why you can't, all the powerlessness you feel you have to actually do something, influence anybody, speak to anybody, answer the right question, it's in your hand. The problem is you have a limited perception of what you see in your hand. You think it's just a stick. But God says, I'm going to show you the potential of what's in your hand. Throw it down. So Moses throws it down. This is a powerful thing because if Moses did not learn this in private with God, it was going to mess him up when he was walking in his destiny. Sometimes God is dealing with you in ways and things you don't understand. You can't wrap your head around it, but God is trying to work in you something in your belief so that you can walk in your calling. And when you're put under the pressure out here, you will already have an experience that you can draw on. Because when he gets stuck on the shore of the Red Sea, he's going to have to use the same stick to part the water. So if he doesn't have any confidence in what is his hands now at the burning bush, he won't have any power in what it is, is in his hand at the Red Sea. And that's the problem today because in the house of God, we haven't experienced the power of God and the Holy Spirit, we've turned away from it suppressed it, walked away from it, been scared of it, tried not to offend people with it. And since we didn't do it in the church, when we get out there, we're powerless. What's in your hand? You need to be empowered in the presence of the Holy Spirit so you can be empowered after this conference weekend in the face of the culture and generation. Come on, tell the person next to you, you've got more in you than you think you do. We have to stop being intimidated as believers. You are empowered by God with what you already have to do. Inside of you is everything that you need to do what he wants you to do. You have more than you think you have. The problem is not coming from what they believe about you. It's coming with what you believe. So don't blame everyone and everything else for why you're not where you want to be. Stop worrying about your past and all the years you feel like you wasted and why it's too late now. And look forward to what God is calling you to be today. It's called being empowered for today. You can't change yesterday. You can't change history. You can change the future, though. The Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. Look at that. It became a rod in his hand. He caught it as a snake, and it became a rod in his hand. Sometimes you won't see something change until you grab it. The problem with most people is they want to see what is ahead before they're willing to step out. God didn't tell Moses what was going to happen. He just said, do it. Sometimes we have to do it just because God says do it, and we don't see how it's going to work out, and we get all these preconceived ideas, and it makes us nervous, and it makes us scared. We'll do it nervous, but obey God. God says, pick it up. Don't worry what's going to happen. Moses didn't know if he was reaching out into his death or his destiny. Have you ever been there? You don't know if this thing's going to kill you or make you. What you have to understand is that this makes great preaching but scary living. Oh, it's a lot easier for me to stand up here and say with this stick than it is to walk out. But if you can walk it out, Moses, you can rescue a generation that's in captivity. Imagine it. You're you're in a house. There's this six-foot eastern diamondback rattlesnake, one of the ones we have here. And the voice of the Lord tells you, go pick that up by the tail. Now, I wouldn't have a problem grabbing it if I thought I could handle it. But if I thought I could handle it, I would have never run away from it. 
Now you want to see me grab something I don't think I can handle because you're trying to show me that if I can step over my fear and grab something by faith, it will change in my hand. Some of you missed that. Listen, if you can reach over your fear by faith and grab a hold of what God tells you to, it will transform in your hands and it will change you. Moses was changed in that moment. A snake you might need to take hold of might not be a rattlesnake or a cobra or it might be directing your child or speaking to somebody you work with or stepping into your calling or giving in a way you've never given. It depends on what you've been running from. It depends on what holds you and controls you. It depends on what you're afraid of. God's calling you to take a hold of something that you've been running from. I don't know who this is for right now, but God has told you to take a hold of something you've been running from, you've been waiting, you've been hesitating, and God is saying, now this is your time. Reach down and pick it up. Don't ask why. Don't worry about what's going to happen. Just obey God. God called me to preach at 18 years old. My experiences in church as a teenager had not been all that glorious. We had some moments, didn't we? But I wanted to do a lot of things besides ministry. I didn't like the religious-minded, superficial, judgmental church people God had called me to minister to. I didn't feel like I could relate to the lost people in the world, and I didn't like the church people. So I needed to find something else, right? But God will often bless you through the thing that you're most afraid of, through the thing that you feel least empowered to do. I remember the first place I was in Bible school, the first place I ever worked in ministry was in a large street ministry in inner city Dallas. I saw things I'd never seen before. I was a church kid. I grew up in, there goes a stick. It's not a snake, don't worry. All right, just was making sure. Anyway, here's the thing. I was in Dallas, and, and I'm like thrust into this center of inner city Dallas where within three months before I started work there, eight police officers had been shot and killed within three or four blocks of where I was working. And this was something that I saw. I saw things and experienced things I never even knew existed except maybe in a movie. And it challenged me and it intimidated me because there were things that I saw that I could not really relate to. I mean, I knew they were there, but I couldn't really relate to. And I figured I don't have what it takes inside of me to, to, to affect that or change that. And somebody told me something that changed my life. And they said, listen. You don't have to relate to the situation. You just have to relate to the one who can change the situation. It changed my life. And I started learning and I started growing in things that I didn't realize. God will call you to places that are unfamiliar. He will call you to things that are not comfortable. He will push you out of your zone in order to teach you and show you part of the things that are ahead in your destiny. But you have to not back down when you know God is telling you to step out and do something. Listen, this day is too messed up. The time is too short. This generation is too hungry. We need somebody that will get out of themselves enough to step into the power of God and let a generation see that the God we serve is still alive. Verse 5, that they may believe that the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. God is after belief. But listen, you're not going to see it until you take hold of it. One day I started preaching and forgot to be scared. One day the identity inside of me started just coming out of me. You cannot overcome what you will not confront. I could go home right now and I just preached with that one statement. So let's read on, verse 6. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, Now put your hand inside your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom. When he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And he said, Put your hand again in your bosom. 
So he put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out of his bosom, and behold, it was restored like his other flesh. Here's what God was trying to show Moses. They will believe, Moses, when you believe. I asked God, what is it going to take to change this generation? How can we impact this culture? How can we see these things? Kevin was articulating so well at the beginning of this message. How can we see this thing broken? How can we see these lying spirits over this generation destroyed? And God said this, they're going to believe when you do. Whew. Problem is we play it too safe. Put your hand in your bosom, it comes out leprous was the most feared disease of that day incurable and not only was it incurable it caused you to be ostracized from society so he puts it back in and it comes out healed God is saying don't you see how I am in control of situations do you see how I can control the outcome even when there's no cure so God gives Moses a terminal disease and then takes it away. Why? Just to show Moses who his boss is. That's who you're working for. That's what he's able to do. Why? Because God was empowering the belief of Moses that he would need to face Egypt, to face the sorcerers of Egypt, to break out the people of God that were completely lost themselves and get them out of Egypt, to get them to the place that God had them to be. And it could not happen until Moses believed first. What are you afraid of when the power of life and death is in God? What are you afraid of? Then it will be, verse 8, if they do not believe you nor heed the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. Now, don't forget, Moses also has a difficult time communicating. Some people say he had a speech impediment, but the real issue was he was raised in the palace of Egypt, and he was worried about addressing the Hebrews in their language. It was really just an excuse. Whatever it was, it was an excuse. But God will take your weakness and use it. Hebrew was not his first language. Either way, he struggled communicating, but communicating is what God was asking him to do. Wait a minute, God. You want to use the weakest part of me to do the greatest thing that's ever been done? Yes, because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Do you want to be empowered? Let God come in your weakest place. Let God use you in the place that you are most unable to be used to do the thing that you know least about and if you will meet God in that place he will open up the door for your destiny and you will see who God called you to be God will use you in spite of your doubts he'll use you in spite of your level of competence he will use you in spite of your insecurity he will use you in spite of your lack but God cannot use unbelief What they think is not the problem. What you're scared of is not the problem. Your fear and ability are not the problem. The problem I'm having you with you, Moses, is belief. Five times in this passage, one word, believe. 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 The reason God appeared to Moses in the burning bush in the first place, the reason he asked Moses a question, what's in your hand? The reason God afflicted and then healed Moses' hand of leprosy is that God was challenging what Moses believes. I'm not talking about what you say. We all know how to say the right stuff. I'm talking about what you believe. You've got to believe what you believe. Either God is the God he says he is, either he's the God of power or he isn't. God doesn't change. His nature doesn't change. The same powerful God of the New Testament church, the same powerful God of the Old Testament prophets, the same powerful God throughout all of time and eternity, the one who spoke and the world came into existence is inside of you, calling you, empowering you to be who God called you to be. So quit worrying about all of the nonsense that surrounds you in culture and get caught up all up in the drama and get into the power of God Rise above it and be who God called you to be. Come on. 
I've said this many times. That's the whole secret of Peter walking on the water. God is anointing you to walk on top of what other people are drowning in. He's anointed you to be on top of something. He's anointed you to go over something, not to sink into it, be affected by it, be controlled by it, be opinionated about it, make Facebook posts about it. If I could get Christian to make half as many Facebook posts about Jesus as they make about their political opinions, my God, we might win the world. We say the right things. We've been taught how to imitate faith. But we have to go home and live out our belief. If you believe you're not powerful, if you believe there are reasons why you can't be who God called you to be, if you believe you've made too many mistakes, if you believe you're too old, if you believe you're too late, nothing will overcome the belief that you have in your heart. What you believe becomes your reality. What you believe about this generation becomes its reality. What you believe about your marriage becomes its reality. What you believe about your home becomes its reality. What you believe about your work becomes its reality. What you believe about the calling on your life becomes its reality. Then we try to convince everyone else to believe something that we don't believe ourselves. Come to Jesus. It makes you powerless. It is double-minded. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Don't even imagine that you will receive anything from God. Don't be a Christian atheist. So tonight the Lord sent me here for one purpose, to challenge your belief. And I said, Lord, how can I challenge the belief? And he said, all belief, all faith is produced by this. Hearing. You didn't believe you were dumb until you heard somebody tell you you were dumb. You didn't believe you couldn't follow God. You didn't believe you couldn't break that habit. You didn't believe you can afford it until you heard yourself or somebody else say it. You heard it. Your unbelief is a result of something you heard, a lie that you heard that you believed about yourself. We have a whole generation of people. There's people here right now trapped in bondage because you believe things about yourself that God never said, but somebody else said or you said. And your life has fulfilled the prophecy that you heard about yourself. You're just like your father. You'll never amount to anything. You won't ever do that. All those things you hear are curses. They're curses on your purpose. They're curses on your destiny. They're curses on this generation. They may not be cussing, but they're curses that are pronounced over you that said you couldn't do this, that said you couldn't do that. And the more you heard it and rehearsed it and even argued about it and said you didn't believe it, still there and every time you face a challenge tell the truth don't those voices come back every time you hit a low place every time things go wrong don't those voices come back you have to change your belief you see you and your purpose are made powerful when you believe but you will never be completely healed or strengthened or empowered Moses until you change what you hear so you can change what you believe how does that happen look at this last verse I'm going to read Romans chapter 10 Romans chapter 10 and verse 14 Romans chapter 10 and verse 14 how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings and good tidings. I have pretty feet. I told the people in my office before this, I said, I have beautiful feet. I have gorgeous feet. I said, you want to take my shoes off and look at my feet? I have beautiful feet. You have pretty feet. Tell somebody next to you, you have pretty feet. Because you're called to carry the gospel. And the Bible says feet that carry the gospel are pretty feet. 
Verse 16, but they've not all obeyed the gospel. Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? And now I want you to look at this, verse 17. So then faith comes by, faith comes by, faith comes by, and hearing by the word of God. What is going to unlock your belief today? The Word of God. Why am I throwing scriptures at you like a machine gun? Why am I preaching this? Why did I have Prophet Kevin come up and lay out this beginning introduction of what God is saying? Because I want to unlock your belief today. And I believe every word I'm speaking is the word of a preacher that is coming into your ears. That is unlocking the destiny that God has called over you. I prophesy today over you that you are going to rise up church of Jesus Christ you are going to rise up men of God women of God pastors and leaders and you are going to step up into the power that God has called us to walk in and show the world and this generation that God is alive and that he's real and that he's powerful and that everything we need is in him Come on, you're a generation like Moses. You have to rise up to face. You have to rise up to confront the things that are facing us. And confrontation doesn't just look like my opinion versus your opinion. It looks like whatever's out here versus the power of God. Mm, Jesus, God's word is here to empower your belief. And as he empowers you, you will become something powerful. Come on, right now, just stand up right now. I just... I, I want to just shift right now. I want you to just grab hands with somebody next to you. That the person next to you, the person that you're grabbing a hold of. There's some area in their life today that that God is is capturing. There's some area of their life that God is is giving a, a burning bush encounter. He's speaking into your purpose. He's getting into your getting your attention. The enemy of your soul is lying to what you believe so he can stop your destiny. Not tonight. Come on, today we're going to drive out some lies. Woo! Jesus, today we're going to drive out some fear. Today we're going to drive out some uncertainties. Today we're going to drive out some bad attitudes. Today we're going to drive out some bitterness and offense. Today we're going to drive out some unbelief. We're going to drive out some bad choices. Come on. Come on, let it go out of you into that person next to you right now. Just begin to pray. Man, I feel something stirring. It's like, like water just beginning to boil. Come on, I feel something Come on, power is waiting on you today. Not everybody has the same purpose. Not everybody has the same calling. But you have to know who you're called to be. I had to figure it out. I had to obey God when I had a better idea. But now the thing that God has called me to do has empowered me to touch more lives, to see things more incredible things than I could have ever seen in my own decision today. The person's hand that you're holding, you're, you're grabbing onto destiny today. You're grabbing onto purpose today. You're grabbing onto an answer today for a generation. You're grabbing on today to the power of God. Come on, it's your hands. You've got to grab on this thing today. Jesus, the anointing is in this place. Come on, it's no accident that I'm preaching out of Exodus because there's coming a massive Exodus today out of captivity in the name of Jesus. The Red Sea is going to part in front of you because God is empowering you to walk in your destiny. It's your year, it's your season. Come on, in the name of Jesus, I declare liberty. In the name of Jesus, I declare victory. In the name of Jesus, I declare your purpose is going to be established. Come on, right now. That, that, that person that you're, that you're connected to right now. Jesus. Come on, pastors. I'm speaking to you leaders that are in this room. Church leaders, come on. I believe God's calling us like He's calling me. I believe He's calling us to a new level of faith, a new level of expectation, a new level of miracles. A new level of, 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 of strategy. A new voice that is steadfast and sure and unmovable and biblical. 
Come on, I, I call out to churches that are represented in this room right now. And God is igniting you in the name of Jesus. He's igniting you. He's igniting you. Come on, we have, we have some, I know we have some, some cute people in this place and you don't have to do anything. And we have some dignified people and you don't have to do anything. And we have some quiet people and you don't need to do anything. But, but I want about a hundred or so radical, crazy people to get out in the aisle, to come into the front of this building that says, I want to cross the Red Sea of my destiny today. I want to get out of where I've been. I want to go somewhere I've never been before. If that's you, come on, I want you to get out of here. Get out of the aisles, get out of the middle, whatever. Push somebody aside if you have to push them aside. Whatever you need to do. Come on, it's going to happen today. It's going to happen today because you believe it's going to happen today. Jesus, my God, come and baptize us, God. Baptize us with power. Baptize us, God, with your, with your grace. Baptize us with faith, God. Come on, I, I'm just standing here as real and raw as I could be. I would love to tell you I'm always walking in faith and power. And, and I always have that faith-built answer. Sometimes... Sometimes I get cold. Sometimes I get comfortable. And God has to shake me up. Today we're shaking some things up in you. Come on, we're shaking some things up. Come on, raise your hands high. Come on, just begin to cry out to God. Shake up my destiny, God. Push me into a place I've never been. Let me see what you call me to see. Let me believe in a God that can do anything that sickness and cancer has to bow to. A God that raises the dead. A God that sees people delivered. A God that can have power over demons. A God that's bigger than politics. A God that's above whatever social issues are here and brings deliverance. A God that has an answer for a world with no answers. God, God, we cry out to you. Lord, we cry out to you, God. Oh, Jesus. Shake me up. Prepare me for my destiny. Empower me, God. Empower me. Just tell him, say, Lord, baptize me for my next dimension. Baptize me for my next place. Baptize me. Come on. Cry out to him. Come on. Don't be quiet. Don't be nice. Come on. Don't be dignified. Just press into God a little bit. Get desperate for this generation. Get desperate for this day. Get desperate to see God move in your church. Get desperate to see God move in your family. Get desperate to see God move in your job. Get desperate to see God move in the marketplace. Get desperate. Get desperate. Get desperate, oh my God. Oh my God. Oh Jesus, I'm desperate for you. I'm pressing into you, God. I'm pressing into you. Come on, young people in this room. Come on, that you're in the young generation. God is anointing you like Moses to bring deliverance to people that are bound and broken. They don't know if God is real. They don't trust the Bible. They don't trust leaders and men of God. But God's going to anoint you like Moses to go into a generation like the Hebrew people. They didn't even know if there was hope outside of Egypt. But God had to raise up Moses. Come on, young people. Come on, young people. Come on, young people. If that's you, cry out to God. Tell God, Lord, make me a Moses for my generation. God, make me a Moses. Empower me. Strengthen me. Let me see something I've never seen, God. Let me believe. Let me believe. Jesus, come on. Come on, if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, just begin praying in tongues right now. God is doing something right now. There's something being released right now. This is too important. It's too urgent, guys. It's too urgent. If you don't see the urgency right now, you need to say, God, help my unbelief. God, help me to see and believe who you call me to, 
to reach what you call me to do. Come on, right now. Come on, just sing it, sing it. I am a child of God. I'm not a slave to fear. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. Come on, make your declaration. Say that again. I'm no longer a slave. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. Right now, hold on a second, hold on a second. Dave, I looked over here at you and I heard God speak two words to me. And I know they're, they, they seem like just words that you hear a lot in circles that you're in. But the words were fresh fire. And the Lord told me that he's coming to anoint your tongue with fresh fire. That God is, is heating up the prophetic voice of your ministry. In this next season, in the next, in the next six months, you're going to see an escalating. Uh, you're going to start to speak one thing and even uh, words of encouragement, but it's going to have fire on it. It's going to have pepper sauce on it. And it's going to penetrate the people's hearts. And it's going to penetrate the people that you're speaking into in a dimension that you that you've walked in some, but you're going to walk in this almost consistently for the next several months. It's going to come within the framework of your nature, but it's going to come out with such power. And there's people that are around your ministry that are imitating faith, but they're not walking in faith. And God says, I'm going to cause you to ignite faith out of your heart, out of your experience, out of your life, out of your history. I'm going to cause you to ignite the faith of the people around you. I saw it happening to you. I saw it happening to you. I saw it. I see something in that. I looked over here. Fresh fire is coming on you. Fresh fire is coming on you. Fresh fire. Fresh fire. For the purposes of God. Doug, I want you to raise your hand. You've been in, you've been situated and positioned in a place You've had people judge, you've had people talk about, you've had people say he can do it, he can do it. You had people that support you, not support you, and then support you again, and you've had all kinds of things. But let me tell you, there's something that is inside, and, and the Lord showed me that you have, I saw, saw like, like, like lead on the inside of your shoes, like your feet are planted, man. Your feet are planted, but there's something that you've gone after, I'll never forget. When Dave Wagner brought you here the first time and it was just you, and it was like something that was like just like a almost like a kid in a candy store, not so much seeing stuff here, but seeing what God could do there. And God is going to reopen the insight of your eyes for the purpose of a place where so many have settled for something less than the purposes that God has established. And God is coming to take your eyes and focus them like you've never been focused before. Amen. And you're going to see into the realm of the spirit and you're not going to see in the realm of the natural. Amen. Sometimes the realm of the natural is so blinding it's hard to see past it. But God is going to open your eyes to see into the realm of the spirit of your region like never before and not just the, the specific area that you're at in Connecticut but there's some other key areas and connections even this year that God has connected you with in terms of men of God that are just kind of right on the edge and I saw you guys like joining hands and jumping over the edge man jumping over the cliff in, in terms of faith not in terms of destruction but in terms of faith and I see God taking you to a new dimension empowering you in a new level of your faith of your ability to believe God 
of your ability to pray for what you can't see in the natural. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I release the power of God. Come on, just stretch your hands up here right now. To Doug and all these guys that, that came such, on such a long trip through storms. Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name that nothing is going to stop the purposes of God. And where there's a hunger that'll press through storms and not change plans because of it, we're starting to see things like Jesus did when his disciples wanted to abandon ship and he stood up and said, peace be still. We ignite the purposes of God in the midst of what God has established to happen in a region Stuff's happening, things are going, but there's something in a realm that you can touch, man. The hand of God is on you for that time and that purpose.